Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest Robbie Holes, who's here to share with us two books. Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening and Secrets of Aboriginal Healing. So let's welcome to the show, Robbie Holes. Thank you, Marianne. Nice to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about both these books. You know, it, it's so interesting. When I started picking this up and reading it, I was like, wow. I mean, how did any of this even come on your radar? <laughs> Well, you know, it's certainly brought to you, whether you expect it or not, which usually you don't. Um, I think that, you know, my husband, my late husband was a uh, a physicist who um, contracted multiple sclerosis and he was desperate for answers. And so I think that's when the Aboriginal remote healers in Australia came on his radar. And that's the amazing journey into the outback to find answers to survive because he had about six months left to live. So that's when he discovered that the Aboriginal tribes people have amazing healing abilities and insights. And this is what brought him down that path. And then eventually when I met Gary in uh, years later, he, of course, brought all that to my um, awareness as well. Well, that's just so amazing what the both of you have done with the books that you've written. And I know you've carried on your husband's legacy. When you first met with the Aboriginals, how how was that? Well, I met with the Aboriginals in 2008. I was uh, invited to participate in ceremonies with the women. They had... um, decided to open up their ways, their ceremonies to women from across the the world. And I was uh, the one that was invited from the United States. And so I went there in 2008 into the outback. um, And I had, I deliberately had no clue. I didn't want to read about it and and have any, you know, expectations. And I was really, uh, it's a very, very different world, as you can imagine. First of all, the outback is incredibly harsh. It is so, so hot during the day. And at night, it's absolutely freezing. There are wild pigs, wild camels, some of the biggest, I mean, we literally had a a spider, tarantula, whatever you want to call it, the size of a dinner plate, chasing my campmate around the fire. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, and some of the most deadliest uh, snakes in the world. I mean, they're, they're there in this really harsh uh, out, outback, but the Aboriginal people don't see it that way. They see it as this incredible um, environment that they are immensely grateful for. And it's a very different attitude, immense connection to the planet, to the earth, uh, incredible gratitude and responsibility to take care. To me, they're like the original environmentalists because they're the oldest continuous culture on the planet. And they're very, very connected, Marianne, to the environment and also to their ancestors. So it was a really interesting opportunity to be with them and perform ceremonies. I can't go into the ceremonies because those are obviously secret, but I can tell you the effects that they had on me. And they call ceremony, not at a specific time, like we would do here in the Western culture, they call ceremony when the energy is right and everything is aligned. And so you never know when they're going to call ceremony and you go and you participate and your body becomes the canvas. They paint you um, according to what's going to happen. And I had the opportunity to feel you know how we, you know that we're all connected. You know that everything is one. Intellectually, I knew that, but I got to actually feel that when I was in ceremonies. I got to feel that oneness, that everything just sort of rolled into each other. There was no distinction. There was no separation. And I also got to feel in these ceremonies because they raise the vibrations. They raise the energy so high that you feel things that you normally wouldn't feel. Um and I, I got to feel the immense love from Gaia, you know, from our mother planet. She has tremendous love for us. It's quite passionate. And I got to actually feel that. So that was, there were two things that I got to experience um, that were real gifts that have stayed with me my lifetime. I can completely understand why just experiencing that sounds just remarkable. And there's such a different perspective. 
how do they view life and, and how is it so much different than what we view? Well, the, uh, the so Gary, my late husband, went into the outback in 1994, and he experienced tremendous changes after being with them for a short period of time and came back as a scientist where everything was pretty black and white. It didn't exist if you couldn't prove it. And came back recognizing there's a lot that exists, even if you can't prove it, there's a lot of gray area. Um, and I had the opportunity to be with a different tribe, uh, tribes women from all over in 2008. And we were both fortunate in that we were able to experience remote Aboriginal people who are, do not have connection to quote unquote civilization, Western civilization. Um, they are, have retained the ability to be telepathic. Um, they are, you know, they will f- communicate to the water, find out where the water is. They'll communicate to the plants to find out what herbs to use for what needs. They can speak to the animals, to each other. They don't speak out loud. They consider that to be quite uh, chaotic. And um, they spend more than half of their time in what we might call dream time. It's sort of this meditative state where they are in what you might call these other dimensions or realities. And they'll tell you that that is more real than what this world is. And they start doing that at a very young age, like three or four, they start doing that. And they spend more than half of their time there, which means that they have managed to get that mind quieted and connect to that, tap into that inner wisdom, that tremendous wisdom that's available to us. And that's what they do. So I kind of feel like they are the ones that we were associated with. We were, um, they were like fifth dimensional beings showing us what that looks like. They, they don't have um, a, pos- a they don't even have a, a word for a, that's possessive. There's no my that they're, you know, or mine. They, everything is shared. They have this tremendous desire to be of service to each, to others. They are living in higher vibrations of frequency. They don't have competition. Um, there's no ego. Uh, when the hunter comes back with food, there's tremendous respect and honoring to that food source. And the hunter will probably be uh, sometimes the last to eat. Um, it's shared communally. It's a really different world, but it's showing us what this higher frequency, higher consciousness life looks like. I can't even imagine a child getting to this you know, level of connectedness when, yeah. you know, as adults, I mean, we have a hard time doing it ourselves. Yeah. Can you imagine, though, re- recognizing at a very, very young age how to share and that it's not about self, it's about community, connection to the land, connection to ancestors. They also have, um, they have retained this, is, this is what they taught Gary when he was with them for a short time, is they they are very, it's very easy for them to tap into these other dimensions or Um, realities, whatever you want to call them. So it's very easy for them to see and communicate to spirit guides, to angels, to ancestors. Uh, There were Aboriginal healers who had deceased who would appear in front of Gary when he was with these people. And I mean, this was, you can just imagine for a a physicist, this was pretty mind-blowing, but it dramatically changed him. And he came back and started developing those same abilities where he could see into the body He could communicate to the other side. And he started doing what they were doing, where he spent many, many hours a day connecting to um, outside this reality, connecting to this uh, tremendous wisdom, um, this oneness, whatever you want to call it. Everybody has a different viewpoint on that. But it was um, he, he ended up the reason Gary had multiple sclerosis and ended up as a quadriplegic in a wheelchair is because the the Aboriginals taught taught him that he had, uh, you know, he had numbed himself to emotions because he had such a really abusive childhood. His father was an alcoholic who beat him. And so Gary, with this brilliant mind, learned how to numb himself to that until he literally numbed himself physically. And so the Aboriginals taught him the connection between the emotions and the body. And they also helped him recognize that to not be afraid of emotions. They talk about how we tend to be very afraid of emotions and feeling certain things. Whereas the Aboriginal people have this understanding, let it come to you, you feel it, and then you just let it go. What's next? 
we tend to get stuck um, and hang on to things, whereas they experience it and then they just let it go and move on, staying in the present moment, not hanging on to the past or fear of the future, that sort of thing. So th- this is one of the things that they taught Gary is to recognize the connection that the mind has to the body and how the body will show um, you know, where the mind is getting stuck and creating problems. Because if it doesn't feel good emotionally, it's affecting the body uh, as well. When you had your connection experience, what did that feel like or look like for you? You know, it was pretty um, scary at first when I first met them because we met them at night in uh, bonfires. It was dark and um, it was a very different culture. The, the, the land was very different. It was red. I felt like I had just landed on another planet um, and it was quite frightening. And then I saw children. And I thought, oh, of course, these are women. They, Of course, they have children. And then I saw a, a dingo, a dog. And I thought, well, oh, yeah, of course, they have dogs. They have pets. That, you know, they have animal companions. So it, it, I gradually started to just let go of the fear and embrace that this was very different and feel that they had much to teach me. And one of the things that I enjoyed um, <clears throat> There were these women that had been gathered, probably about 24, 20 of us maybe from around the world. These were amazing women that had done some amazing things. And it was just really uh, interesting to be around these women who were able to just let down their guard in this environment of love. And I tell you what was really interesting, Marianne, that kind of was refreshing. We're we're in this really hot desert, right? We are bacon. Um, and you you don't really have a lot of access to water. And it got to the point where after about a week, right, you are just ripe. Your hair is just standing on edge. It's just so filled with sand um, and dirt. And it was really refreshing to not have to worry about hair or makeup or appearance or any of that as dirty as we were. We're like little kids, right? You know, we just didn't care and it felt really good. And and the other women were commenting on that as well, because we don't realize how we are so culturally conditioned, um, especially with appearance in certain occupations. And it was just, that was just one of the things that I really enjoyed was just letting go of some of these conditionings that we have that we're not even seeing. Oh, I'm all for that, you know, (laughs) (laughs) because I mean, we do live in a, in a world where we have to look a certain way and be a certain way. And and, Hey, I I get that. I understand, but it's nice to be able to go play in the rain every once in a while, you know? Yes. Yes. And speaking of rain, we did end up, um, I didn't know this at the time because there's, there's a language barrier, right? They're, they're speaking their, um, their pigeon English or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we, the reason that they were grateful that they had invited these women and there were no men, the men were outside of our view of, we didn't know where they were, but what we were doing was so powerful with these ceremonies that we needed the men outside holding us and creating a safe environment for us. And we ended up creating um, ceremonies that were so powerful. We ended up creating rain uh, thunderstorms that just kept circling the camp that they, um, when we finally made it back to the uh, hotel, I don't know if it was 10 days later or whatever, they said they hadn't seen rainstorms like that in a long, long time. So we were creating these rainstorms because they needed that for their crops to grow, you know, some of their food. And so we were creating these rainstorms and the energy that we were, all the women were bringing from around the world together, uh, being guided by these Aboriginal tribes, women created this powerful storms that just kept coming around the camp. And it was refreshing to be standing out in this rain, um, just really uh, enjoying something that we take for granted every day, beautiful rain, right? Nourishing water. So it was, uh, it was, it was, there were a lot of interesting things that, um, and that was one of them that I don't think we realized the magnitude of that until later, the Aboriginal people told us how that was really um, a gift that we had um, helped them create. That must have been just so remarkable to be there and to experience that. I'm sure, I mean, I would guess that they are so used to that happening when they uh, work together to 
have the rain come through that they're kind of used to it. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we got rain. Let's go on to the next thing. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they're, they're, they're really tuned into nature. You know, they've never lost that. And that's something that has been continued to be passed on. I mean, we know that they're the oldest continuous culture on the planet. We know they're at least at least 60,000 years old, but they're much, much older than that. And and so they have if you retain these, if you because the outback is so huge, I cannot emphasize that enough. It's vast. We flew in a plane for hours just to get into the middle of it. It is so vast. And so they are safeguarded from people and and civilization and so that they maintain these old ways, that they maintain this connection that they have to the planet, to the earth, to Mother Earth, to their ancestors, to guides on the other side of the veil. They've, they've maintained that and developed that. And it's really interesting and a, really an honor and a gift to be able to step into that world briefly and see what that looks like and what that feels like. And it's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly moving. And I feel really blessed to have been a part of that. Yeah, I can see why. I know most of our listeners probably um, don't know that actually this is when they were teaching you a lot of these healing principles, um, both you and your husband were the first people they were teaching this to outside of their own group of people. Yeah, they didn't, you know, I, I, I don't know if Gary even really knew this at the time. Um, they don't disclose their healing information very readily because the white man has taken so much from them and not really given anything in return. But he was, they knew Gary, they knew Gary was coming before he even knew about them. They had been told he would be coming. They were told that it was in their best interest to give their healing secrets and healing uh, methodology and, and insights to this man who would be coming from the United States. Because we were not tainted at all. We had no understanding of who they were. We didn't have any uh, prejudices or anything. And they asked him to take this information out. And when I was there with them, I asked them just to verify, you know, is this really what you want us to do? And they said, yes, please take this information out. Because people don't really understand how healing works and it's time it's needed um that there that it's a body mind soul thing and that there are simple steps to this they gave us the five steps to it which we talk about in secrets of aboriginal healing with their permission and at their request we put this information out and i was really shocked I mean, after my husband passed in 2007, I got this book out about his experience in the Outback, The Secrets of Aboriginal Healing. I did it really just in honor of him. And what I was shocked to see was that it resonated with people across the planet because now it's in, both of these books are in over 44 countries because it resonates with people. They can feel the truth in it and they're ready for that kind of information. So it was a real... um, opportunity to make sure that we got it right, that we were uh, quite respectful and honoring them and that this was truth and that we gave back to them as well. It wasn't just taking this information. It was also giving back to them as well. So we were um, very cognizant of that. And uh, this information has been tremendously helpful because we're missing some pieces to the healing and so this is where they were saying, this is, you know, you, you can't just deal with the symptoms of the body. The mind is very involved in this. Uh, the soul is very involved in, in, in this. And if you have the body, soul, and the um, uh, emotions on board with healing, if all three of those are aligned, anything can be healed. So this was Uh, information that was really powerful that I don't think people really appreciated the effects that the mind has on and the emotions have on the body. I mean, scientists are starting to wake up to this. They realize now that if you experience, for instance, I think there was a study that that showed if you were experienced to 15 minutes of stress, it lowers your immune system for like 24 hours, if not longer. So there is a direct connection between the emotions and disease. And, you know, this is something that people need to pay attention to. Otherwise, you know, you can have tumors or, you know, cancer, um, you know, removed surgically or with chemo or radiation. But if you continue to create the same emotional responses that created that in the first place, 
it's just going to come back again. So they helped us realize that the emotions that are really hard on the body, the body and the emotions are so connected because the body is showing you where you're getting into trouble with emotions and thoughts. Really, really hard on the body are emotions like shame, guilt. Um, those create a different chemical response. They create a different cell, which Dr. Rimoto showed us with his water photography, what that looks like. It's very, um, it's it, it, it's just... It's a discombobulated cell. It doesn't look uniform. Um, It has a different chemical response. It also has a different response energetically where it blocks emotions. Whereas if you, so it's really either fear-based emotions or it's love-based, okay? And love-based has a different, beautiful effect on the body. It helps the body thrive. It keeps that energy flowing. It has a different chemical response. And Dr. Emoto's water photography showed us how love-based emotions create cells that are just gorgeous, like snowflakes, very symmetrical. And some of the emotions that are the best to heal with are, of course, love is always paramount, but forgiveness, um, gratitude. Gratitude is just one of those emotions that I think people take for granted, and it does so much uh, in so many ways. So this is what the Aboriginal people were helping us recognize is the connection between the emotions and also how to get that mind on board. And this is why, you know, when Gary came into the outback in his wheelchair as a quadriplegic um, in 74, I think it was 94, I'm sorry, 94, he did not he was very, very angry at his father, had not forgiven him. And the body was showing this, right? This tremendous blockage. So the Aboriginal, we talk about this in Secrets of Aboriginal Healing, how they help him let go of that anger and actually move to forgive him, which frees the body and allowed him in, um, in, in a, like, I think it was like 10 days, he started to feel body, uh, feel parts of his body that he hadn't felt in seven years, he was able to create movement because he was letting go of these emotions that had been uh, imprisoning him. So this is what they help. They take him through the steps of the five steps of how to let go of these things that are creating problems, how to move through that and come out the other side to love-based emotions and recognize that his father for instance, as as harsh as he was to him, was actually his greatest teacher and helped him evolve the most so that he could release this anger and realize with gratitude that this is something that, um, you know, was important for him, helped him move very quickly in evolution and growth because of his father. A lot of times we just never look at the people that hurt us really bad as someone who's helping us evolve you know, and what a yes. great viewpoint. Yes, that you can learn like Gary did in one lifetime, what may have taken many, many lifetimes to achieve, right? So it's intense, but it helps you make huge leaps in growth and evolution. So people are in your life for a reason. And if the same things keep happening, the same type of situations keep happening, this is showing you where your homework, so to speak, is in this learning lab that we are here on on planet earth it shows you where you're getting stuck where the mind continues to get triggered because where you're getting triggered is where your homework lies why are you holding on to some attachments or some belief systems or distortions that are creating this negative triggering that becomes toxic over time? So when you have these emotions that are um, depression or frustration or anger or fear, it's going to affect your body over time if you keep doing that. So it's like this dashboard in a car starting to blink, warning you. That's what these emotions are doing. They're warning you. You're starting to have, you're getting stuck and you're going to create a problem. And if you keep having those emotions and you don't release them and move on, like the Aboriginals show us, then that dashboard stays lit all the time now of a sudden and you have that illness or disease. Um, autoimmune diseases are often created by um, fear-based, a lot of fear-based Uh, emotions that that are just held throughout the whole body. And so you might have a genetic predisposition to certain illnesses or diseases, 
you that might be your weakest link. And so this is going to show you where you're creating problems. And it's time to let go of that. It's time to maybe forgive yourself. It's time to recognize you needed to go through those experience for your own growth and, and evolution. And other people are here to help you. You've got soul contracts with other people to help you do that as well. So uh, usually family members, because it's really hard to get away from family members. And our culture has expectations of family. And so it's not uncommon to have soul contracts with family members who are here designed to trigger you to show you where the mind is still holding you back from being in love. That is just remarkable. And yeah, you know, what I love about this is in the book, you also talk about how this is supported by modern science. You know, this isn't just yeah. wishful thinking. No, I mean, Gary was this, um, you know, he was a, an award-winning, respected, highly respected physicist. And he came back from his short time in the outback and Rick, with the Aboriginal healing principles, decided to get a doctorate degree in immunology to practice what they had taught him, but to have that credibility in the medical community to do what he was going to be doing. Got a doctorate, got a, a master's degree in nutrition to recognize how food can assist in healing and, and uh, health. But he practiced what was called what we call psychoneuroimmunology. And it's how the mind affects the immune system and how it affects the body. So it's something that's becoming more and more respected and well-known. It's not unusual now to have um, people start, you know, delving into the emotions behind it. It's not even unusual now to have meditation in being taught in hospitals, being taught in, in wider, wider circles, because they're recognizing how the mind is affecting us. And we need to learn, if we're going to find peace and health and vibrancy, learn how to control that mind rather than it controlling and sabotaging us and our health. So this is what the Aboriginals, this is where, like I said, they spend more than half their time connecting in these higher frequencies, these higher vibrations to help them, um, you know, not be controlled by the mind to have these experiences come to them and then let it go and stay in that present moment and not be, you know, dragged into the past or the future, which is very common. Um, you know, there's this, it's very common in our culture to have a busy mind that's just accepted. And it's really something that you realize it's really just asking for a beating in so many ways, especially, you know, I, I used to have an extremely critical mind. That's the way I was raised. And, and so it was perfect um, with a Catholic upbringing to have a lot of guilt. Um, so what you recognize is that these thoughts, which run rampant, uh, are really not very helpful they're actually counterproductive in so many ways. There's a difference between planning, but there's a, and, and worrying, right? And playing the same thing over and over in our minds. We have these things that loop. And this is where you want to start paying attention to what thoughts are regularly looping through your mind on a regular basis, because those are the ones, those are the lessons, those are the triggers, those are the things that keep coming up to help you learn how to let go to help you learn how to stay in love, gratitude, forgiveness, acceptance. We don't have to like it, but at least accept that this is part of the human experience, the, the human journey. And to, you know, move away from fear-based mind stuff, conditioning, expectations, and just moving back into acceptance, love, non-judgment, those types of things that will make a huge difference. Well, I don't want to go through all of the healing practices they have, but could you share one with us that kind of really stands out for you? I think, um, well, there's so many good ones. I, I think that, well, recognizing, of course, that the role that mind plays in your health and not suppressing emotions you know, there's a, 
we, we want to feel these emotions, right? Let them rise to the surface, let them come to the surface, but we don't want to necessarily be marinating in some of these longer than we need to. Because when you suppress emotion, that also creates problems and disease. So this is where the aboriginals have taught us, don't be afraid of these emotions, let them come up, let them surface, but don't just be hanging out in them on a regular basis, the fear-based, right? That's the ones I'm talking about that become toxic and negative and harmful over time. Let them, let that anger rise up. Surprisingly, anger is not, yes, anger can harm the body, but the thing about anger is it moves very quickly out of your system. This is where anger moves out of your hands and your, your arms and your legs very quickly. Whereas something like shame and guilt which is taught to us at very young ages sometimes, the shame and the guilt, it just stays in you, right? We, some of us aren't even aware that we're operating like that. And so let it, these emotions come to the surface and then let it go, right? You can always find something to be grateful for. So it's about, con- it's about being more mindful and then consciously shifting into thoughts and emotions that are serving you rather than sabotaging. So if you um, have a thought that's creating problems, it's triggering you into angst or negativity or whatever, you start becoming more aware of it. And then you consciously shift it because these are tendencies that we tend to have on this planet at this particular time is we have these negative tendencies. And so you become more mindful that this is going on. It's playing in the background or you're playing that loop. It's like the record needs to be, the needle needs to be lifted off the record for a little bit and then play a different record where you put a different record on. Um, Record is such an old term, but a different song that creates gratitude so that you realize like Gary did, oh, I didn't like what happened with my father and the way he treated me, but I can feel gratitude that he helped me grow so quickly and move beyond these emotions so that they no longer imprison me. They no longer create the pain anymore. So it's about learning to more consciously shift into love-based emotions, maybe not liking something, but accepting that this is the way things are for a reason, because we're all here growing at different paces, at different methods. And so it's not about their journey as much as it is your journey. And and I am here to operate out of love as often as I can. Don't always get it right. Some days are better than others, but that these are opportunities. And some people in your life are huge opportunities to help you grow into love. Yeah, some are bigger than others in that area. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, but do you know what? It puts a, a whole shift on it if you look at it as opportunity as opposed to, gosh, that person's you know really difficult to be around or work with or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't get it, it's going to keep coming to you over and over and over. It's going to keep coming to you until you get it. It's going to keep coming to you until you can't ignore it anymore. So you might have people in your life, family, work, whatever, relationships that are going to bring it to you in your face so that you can't ignore it anymore. And that you, and that the, the best way to move forward is to just move beyond it and let go and, and to stop judging it, stop having attachments to certain Certain things to just move through it with with more love, more gratitude that this is an opportunity that's coming to me, so that you know, like Gary, I might learn in one lifetime uh, and no longer need this lesson, no longer need this in my life, and and move very quickly because I can't ignore it. And that's really what's happening, Marianne, across the planet right now. Things are coming to the surface. The curtain is being pulled back, so to speak, so that we can't ignore it anymore. It can't be buried and we can just continue on our way. It's just so in our face, it creates this opportunity to recognize what's happening, how this affects you, uh, in how you're affecting all of this in your lifetime. What am I contributing? You know, more negativity, fear, whatever. Or can I find in my mind and and state of being feelings of peace, 
feelings of harmony. You know, um, you cannot be in the light while you're holding others in darkness. That's so important to me to recognize that I cannot judge others because this is all here to help us learn. And so things are getting accelerated to get our attention, to help us move very, very quickly um, in ways that have not been done before. You know, in the book of Secrets of Aboriginal Healing, there's a chapter that you talk about just how Rose is working with you and kind of reframing some thoughts. And I found that to be so helpful because a lot of times Mm -hmm. people are like, you know, how do I even look at reframing this when, you know, that's, that's my story. It's true. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that they were very careful about teaching Gary is that what we focus on is what we're creating and what we're obsessed about is what we keep bringing that to us. And so they don't say, for instance, thank you for helping me um, heal the multiple sclerosis because they don't want to give any energy to the multiple sclerosis. It's not unlike that quote about Mother Teresa would never go to an uh, anti-war rally because she didn't want to give any energy to the war, but she would go to a pro-peace rally. Same thing here. So you focus on creating a health healthy, vibrant body. You don't focus on the, you know, this fighting the war on cancer. That's really, to me, it's incredibly negative, but it's also giving an awful lot of energy and power to the cancer. And so this is where you start focusing on that the fact that you're constantly creating new cells. How many new cells do you create a day? It's astonishing. We're such walking miracles. So you start paying attention to where are your thoughts? What are you focused on? And so, you know, like even now with what's happening on the planet, you can focus on some of the real um, negative aspects. It's not a head buried in the sand, right? But it is also about choosing to focus on what you want to create. So when I find myself getting pulled into the fear, the alarming things that are happening, I become more mindful, which is what the Aboriginals taught us. I become more mindful and sort of step back and recognize, is that what I want to add to? Is that what I want to create? And instead, I consciously shift my thoughts to seeing a world at peace, at harmony. Um, that's where I deliberately shift my focus. And 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 it, it makes a difference. It does add up. And this is what's happening one by one around the globe, we are shifting and letting go of this mind stuff that is uh, creating a lot of problems. We're creating a lot more problems and uh, pain and struggle than we need to. And just learning how to shift from that mind to the heart, to that heart-centered living more often, as you can, when you can. What great advice. I I think we all need to do that about now. You know, there's just so much strife going on and differences and what have you. And we can all have differences, but still come from a heart centered place. Yeah. Recognize we're all learning different things at different places. And so, you know, it's, and also what I, I think this is what I needed to learn Marianne because of the way I tended to be this perfectionistic Catholic, um, you know, over achieving, you know, type a double a whatever, but I needed to learn to be, to move into shift and to learn, but with gentleness and patience, that's the key to, to not um, berate myself when I have those days where I am annoyed or I get pulled into emotions that maybe I don't want to be feeling, but to be more gentle and understanding and compassionate and patient with myself. I think we tend to do that with other people more readily than we do with ourselves. So for me, that was a really important lesson is to pay attention to when the critical um, mind pops up again and starts criticizing that I should have, um, I should be feeling something different rather than this annoyance at something. And so I'm like, okay, hopefully I'll do better next time, but I'm not going to beat myself into that position. That's the difference for me is to be more gentle with myself. In your book, Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening, what was the main focus of having to write that book? It's just so powerful. It's, I just want to get your intake on that. I think that the, the re, so to me, 
it got really interesting when Gary came back from the outback. The, the Secrets of Aboriginal Healing is about his journey in the outback and the Aboriginal healing principles. And then the uh, second book, The Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening, starts with he, when he comes back from the outback, which to me was fascinating because we were learning what people, uh, so then Gary was sort of moving forward as this healer using these principles and these techniques that they had taught him. And it also talks about my awakening because I had almost died twice um, from a blood transfusion when I delivered my son um, and, and ended up being tainted with hepatitis C and then hepatitis C almost killed me. And then the experimental treatments almost killed me. Uh, and so I was left in pretty dire straits. Um, with not only still continuing to have hepatitis C raging through my body, but also then chronic fatigue syndrome, temporary brain damage, fibromyalgia, left in, I mean, I couldn't get out of bed for months. And then the Western medicine didn't have anything for me. And I was determined to survive because I had this young child that I knew would not remember me. I was much too, he was much too young to have any remembrance of me. And I also wanted to parent him as much as possible. So this is where I took my power back from what the doctors had said, that this was the way I would be for the rest of my life. And I'm sure they all felt I'd never make it to 40. Um, Certainly not beyond 10 years. Um, And I could see people around me in support groups who were dying every time I'd show up at these support groups, somebody else is gone, right? Because this was back in um, 85 is when I was given the tre- the uh, blood transfusion because we didn't have tests then um, for hepatitis C and we didn't have treatment. So I ended up healing myself completely of all of these things. And you know, the Western medicine doctors would test me all this time. They didn't understand how I had healed what they considered to be incurable, but basically it was following what the Aboriginal people had given Gary. It was the same type of information. It was the same principles. So I think watching what was happening with Gary as a healer and how he was helping people recognize the emotions, the soul's voice in all of this, and watching myself heal as well, what was considered incurable, I wanted other people to recognize how to heal themselves, how to take back your power, how to heal yourself. So that was really the impetus behind the Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening is to empower people and recognize, help them recognize maybe what they've been doing and how to turn things around. And also, very importantly, the soul's voice in this, um, because it does play. A, a, that's something that a lot of people don't talk about um, with healing is what's the soul's intention with this? So that's we talk about that, too. Well, why don't we kind of chat about that a little bit? Because I know a lot of times when people hear, OK, the soul's, you know, how the soul's really kind of processing this or working through this. What would that really mean for somebody as they're going through this process? Well, you know, this is something that the the soul plays a bigger part in this than people think. Again, it's the body, the emotions, and the soul. They all play um, parts in this. If the soul is bringing something to you, for instance, we talked about fibromyalgia earlier. Fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease, and the the emotional, it's not always, but quite common, the emotions are, are behind this. And, and, you know, that was the thing that the Aboriginal people told us. Is it's, like, it's like picking the top of a dam line. If you don't get to the emotional root, the emotional core is just going to come back again. And so you may develop, I'm just using this as an example, fibromyalgia. And it's the way of the body was telling you, you've got some emotional stuff here. You've got a lot of fear that's rampant throughout your system and your body just can't handle it anymore. Our bodies are just crumbling under some of this emotional stuff that we're uh, asking it to hold on to. So the soul may... um, may want you to recognize through this fight, bromyalgia, it's about learning to let go of the fear, learning to let go of this emotional grip that fear has on you. And so it might help you, it, 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 you know, you can ask and pray or whatever, go to healers or all kinds of doctors or practitioners to overcome this fibromyalgia. And they might give you medication to help, you know, take care of the symptoms or to live with it. But the soul wants you to understand it's about learning to let go of these fears. 
And so when you finally do master that, like a couple of other books that I've written are about getting angelic help or help from the other side of the veil through spirit guides or angels, they can help you, but only so much. If the soul wants you to have that fibromyalgia until you have learned to let go of the fear, you can't just ask the angels, your guardian angel or whomever to heal this fibromyalgia until you get the lesson behind it. The soul wants you to get that lesson and no longer need it there, no longer need that blinking light going off on that dashboard anymore. So this is where like the um, you start to recognize the fear is affecting me in a negative way. I need to let go of this stuff. I need to move into more love-based emotions more often, uh, not suppress some of these things that are creating toxicity and negativity. And then the soul is on board with you healing that because you finally get it right you're you're finally getting it and you're doing it then the soul has the green light to heal this but if you haven't gotten the lesson from it it may not be on board with healing it and another example of that we talk about this in the uh, awakening book is that sometimes like for instance a child might be born with a blindness or a certain um, physical impairment that the, this is what the soul has chosen to experience in this lifetime. So we would see, uh, I know that I was in um, Lourdes in France, where there are millions of people coming to these holy waters to be healed. And it's like, if the soul isn't on board with that child regaining its sight, because this is what it wants it to experience, it doesn't matter what you do as far as trying to circumvent the soul's intention. And um if, 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 for instance, if cancer is a vehicle to help let family and friends let go of a loved one so they can move on to the other side of the veil, their life is finished here, cancer might be something that is needed as a vehicle to help them move on, that person who has it, but also importantly, the family and friends who don't want that person to leave. So you never, but in that particular instance, it's the soul's intention for that person to have cancer that does not heal because it's time for them to let go. And so we sometimes need these catalysts to help us move um, in the direction that the soul intends. So this is where you want to pay attention to what's the soul's intention. Is there something that I'm here to learn? And this is a vehicle, this illness, this disease, whatever, is a vehicle to help me learn it. So I no longer need this again in my life. I get it. I'm moving on. Or is it something that, um, you know, this is where you want to pay attention to what's the soul's voice in this. And most people don't talk about that. You know, they have these vision boards. They think if I just focus on it, I give it enough energy, um, this is going to manifest. What's important to pay attention to is what's the soul's intention and voice in this as well. I know you talk about how Gary um, really developed these you know, unique skill sets from being able to spend time with the Aborigines and, and learn. What were those like? What, what did he develop? Well, he developed the ability to become telepathic to things. Um, he would communicate to uh, wildlife, to animals, to people. But interestingly, the only people that typically the only people that knew he was communicating to them on a telepathic level uh, were autistic people. They, they have, they don't have the filters that a lot of us do. And they were able to recognize he was communicating to them telepathically. I thought that was really interesting. And you wouldn't know that, you know, um, but, uh, but I, we had some instances where it became very clear that the telepathic people knew he was communicating to them on a conscious, on, on a telepathic level. He also developed the ability to see on the other side of the veil. Um, he could see guides and angels. He, this is the first time he encountered that was in the outback when he was with this tribe. And he's continued to develop that when he came back so that he could just readily communicate to angels and guides on the other side of the veil. And that's quite often where he was getting his information about, you know, people would come to him and the, he started to develop the ability to see inside the body uh, to communicate to the other side about, you know, how many you know, the tumors or what's affected in the system, what, very importantly, what are the deep rooted subconscious thoughts that are creating this problem? 
and helping them shift. That was one of the things that he started to develop was becoming aware of what was holding somebody back and then helping them recognize that and helping them move beyond that, those thoughts that were really keeping them in these states of dis-ease, if you will. Uh, he, he, I mean, he was astonishing what he developed. That This is what I consider fifth dimensional existence to be, is that you can see, you can, uh, you're telepathic, you are... Um, much more loving and open. He really started feeling his emotions after he came back. This is a man who was pretty buttoned up before, came back and just, I would find him in the kitchen sitting with just tears running down his face because he was just in awe of uh, the of the wonder of the world, right? He was allowing himself to feel that awe and wonder to such a deep level that he was just emotionally moved by it into to tears of joy. So it, there were many, many shifts that happened with him after being with the uh, Outback Aboriginal people. And do you have that same level of giftedness as well, I understand? Well, mine's in a different direction. He's actually part of the team to help. Um, he, what I didn't recognize is that when he would pass in 2007, he lived much longer than the doctors anticipated, that he would be continuing to assist. We'd, we were working together before he passed. We're working together now, Marianne. It's just that he's assisting from the other side of oh the veil. Gosh. And That's so awesome. It is awesome. It is a great, it's a, it's a blessing. He's very involved in my work. What he, What I'm doing is connecting to the other side to get clarity, to get help. So the team that I work with on the other side of the veil, and Gary's part of that team, and so our Aboriginal healers are part of that team. They help people heal. So I'm like the translator for them. Uh, um, you know, we, he considered, Gary considered himself to be a very humble conduit of this energy. And I consider myself to be a very humble conduit so that I am providing the clarity for people. And sort of the bridge so that when people have an intention of working um, with me or through me, they're the ones doing the work. They're the ones clearing the energy, bringing this information. Um, it's, it's a different kind of healing. He did his, he was more hands-on. He would, Gary would put his hand at the base of someone's um, skull because that's where all the, you know, everything was going up the spine and into the brain. And so he was sending tremendous, amount, tremendous amounts of energy into the body through his hand. And his hand would get really hot. He'd have to shake it off every now and then or put it under water because there was so much energy moving through it. That's how he ended up. And then it got to the point where he realized, okay, I don't have to be putting my hand on them I don't even have to be in the same room. I don't even have to be in the same country. I can connect with their first name and what country they're in because then the guides are connecting. The, the team that was assisting him is connecting. Mine is sort of the same thing, but I don't do the, the hands-on like he did initially. Um, it's uh, They're connecting for us. My team on the other side connects with that person's team so that we get a lot of information. And I'm just... the translator to sort of give clarity to what's going on here. Well, I know that you have so many people that are writing about how great it is to work with you and your team. Oh, thank you. So, yes, I, I have to recognize that because I mean, my goodness, you've got some great work that both of you are doing now, you know? Well, and so this is what's happening is that we, you know, this is, and this also happened with Gary. This is actually probably the real reason behind the first book. We were seeing that things were changing dramatically with people and we were having a real effect and it got to the point where we couldn't keep up with it. It was just too much. So we thought, okay, how can we affect more people than ever before? We started going out and doing speaking events. And then we realized, well, this can be exhausting. It's effective, but it's exhausting. So let's write the book, right? So we can get that book out. So that the information is right there. They don't have to go into the outback. They don't have to come and see you. The information is right there. So that was really the impetus behind the first book, Secrets of Aboriginal Healing, is let's give this information. That's way we can affect more people. And that's where it really surprised me to see it take off in 44 countries. And the same thing with the second book, The, the Secrets of Aboriginal Awakening. Same thing. So it got to the point even now where I am now where it's like I cannot 
um, I want to stay balanced. I don't want to exhaust myself, but I want to get this information out because I can't keep doing it one on one. So this is where I wrote the couple the last few books about working with guides and angels, how to get assistance from the other side, the angels in waiting, um, you know, vibrant living so that that information is out there so that anybody can access it from any country. Um, and it's even in audiobooks for people too, so that if they can't read it or whatever, it's available in different languages. Because that's my passion, like you, Marianne, is to get out and make a huge difference in the world and affect people in a positive way. And so I'm finding that having things in these books um, is the best way to get this information out. Well, you're making such a huge wave, and I have to really congratulate you on that. You, I, I think I Thank have time you. for yeah, of course, my goodness. I think I have time for one more question here. You know, I would love for you to share with us one of the, you know, miracle healings that you've seen. Hmm. Wow. Well, or I'll been a part of. <laughs> well, I'll I'll tell you what really kind of. Um, help me move in the direction of Gary because he was um, courting me and I had no interest because I was working with the man and you don't want to get involved with your boss. That's just not a good idea. But he, my sister, one of my younger sisters had uh, vision problems and she was going blind and she had been to every expert she could, you know, come up with, um, been to some of the best clinics. She lived in the Midwest and she was losing her eyesight very quickly. And Gary said, uh, have her come out. I think I can help her. And he, she came out and he, He helped her in a very short period of time so that she regained her vision. Um, And I realized that he had done that for me. And that's when I instantly fell in love with the man. It's like, oh, my gosh, what a beautiful thing that he did. It was like that. That's when like the somebody just flipped the light switch. Right. It's like, oh, he did that for me. So that was kind of a beautiful story that um, kind of really change things between us is that when he helped my sister, I mean, my gosh, talk about getting to your heart, right? Is let's just help a family member heal of blindness. Mm -hmm. Um, That, that was a pretty effective way to woo the girl. So yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And do you know it? And it's interesting because then you can really see also how his process was going, you know, you could tell, okay, you know, I, I really believe in what's happening here because I'm seeing the results. Yeah, it was. It, it, and so what happened then is when, when we would go back to visit my family, which is where my sister was back in the Midwest, we would end up with just so many people that wanted Gary to see them and to help them so that we ended up staying for like a month. We would stay in a hotel and, and uh, get another suite to see people. And it was just all day, every day as long as many as we could get in but at some point you have to come back home because you have people here that want to see him as well this is where it was like this is where we're like okay we got to make a book about this because we can't we can't exhaust ourselves doing it but it was really beautiful to see some of those and we put a lot of those stories in um the aboriginal secrets of awakening which i think are fascinating especially the little blind child who came to us uh there that's to me I, i will never forget that child um so those stories are in there. I find them fascinating. Who heals, who doesn't, who improves, who doesn't. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot to learn from that, whether you're a practitioner or you're just a person who wants to recognize, understand more about healing. Yeah, they're, these two books are such great resources. Well, Robbie, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? Okay, uh, my website is is holeswellness.com, H-O-L-Z-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S.com, holeswellness.com. There's a lot of information up there. Um, The books are up there, uh, an online healing course is up there. But more than anything, there is a lot of free information up there. We want to get this information out to as many people as possible. We encourage people to uh, get as much free information off this website as they want and pass it on and share it because as healing is there for us, a lot of people don't recognize the true ramifications of how to heal. And so, and also how to connect to the other side and get assistance, whether it's from your angels or, um, you know, deceased loved ones or whatever. So it's all up there as much as I could get out to, to get this information out. Robbie, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. 
Thank you, Mary. It's always a pleasure. Well, thank you, Robbie. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your two books, Aboriginal Secrets of Awakening and Secrets of Aboriginal Healing. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.